Hi everyone, Trina here. And um, I thought I would get back into the alchemy book, which is this one for all of you. I hope you can see that. So this is Saint Germain on Alchemy, Formulas for Self-Transformation. And in this book, you know, we got all this stuff going on right now with this, uh, the new king. And um, the, the talk about this new king implementing Nasara. Um, this is so funny because Saint Germain has spoken about this trust for many, many years. And it's so funny because it talks about how Saint Germain um, would be the new, um, like he would be the, the, the ruler of this age, Aquarius, kind of like, um, the Pisces Jesus was, that was that era. Uh, Saint Germain would be the, the master of the era of Aquarius and master Saint Germain, his attribute is, um, seventh is the seventh ray. And within the seventh ray is the violet flame of transmutation. So this is why um, it was the age of, you know, heaven on earth potentially because you'd be filled with the violet fire of transmutation, which is a very powerful ray to be in. So um, I think that we've moved from the blue ray now into the violet. So um, this would explain the change in light, um, the change in government, the change in finances, the change in everything because you would be transitioning from one age to another age. And from what I understand, these, this is an energetic shift. So because energy is the foundation of all matter and all that we see, uh, a shift in this vibration, a shift in this light is going to transform all that we see. And um, it's, a, it's a process that happens gradually. It's not instantaneously, although some things do happen very rapidly from what I was shown. Uh, that's where we get the whole in the twinkling of an eye thing. Um, that can happen, especially when we're jumping uh, timelines. <laughs> so those could happen really, really quickly. So um, we're talking about this new king and um, all this, this, the Nasara stuff started making the connections to Master Saint Germain and uh, Saint Germain and his attributes and what he said that he wanted to accomplish which was restoring an age back into the golden age which was the age that was similar to the one that we had in Atlantis and I think a lot of us came back from that timeline to um, correct what we we did wrong in that timeline was the fact that we um, we went to conquer we, we conquered nature through technology and and that destroyed the continent and we all died pretty much because we we had advanced with technology so much that um we created havoc and it caused major cataclysm and i also think too part of it was a natural cycle so we were kind of into what we are in right now like this is the repeat of atlantis is what i keep seeing in my mind it's like this is so similar it's not 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 exactly the same but it's basically the same lessons we're we're in a place right now where we're going to have to choose what we're going to do with technology and how we're going to let it affect us if it's going to harm the planet and harm us or if we're going to find some way to come into a beautiful, amazing balance with it to where it is such a, a gift to humanity because it can be. It seriously can be. To be honest with you, with you too, I, I have a feeling it might enjoy it much more. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, these are all things that I, I've seen and been trying to put together in my head and, you know, this the financial freedom, the reset of the money, uh, the, the coming of Christ, heaven on earth. I'm like, it's all crazy. And then I start hearing about this master Saint Germain and how they established a trust for humanity that would be able to bring back all of the money that was taken into different programs and different situations and return back to the people. Um, it's quite a beautiful story. And, and then, you know, we were reading about St. Germain and how he's an alchemist and how he can manifest diamonds and jewels and gold. So apparently um, with his abilities and his um, ability to have plenty of money because he knew how to work with the powers like Jesus, he could do miracles, which most people think are miracles. 
but it's literally alchemy. So he, they knew how to do these processes and through their mastery of them, um, they had everything that they needed. So they, you know, they could manifest whatever they needed. St. Germain, um, Jesus was walking around in robes and a sandal. He wasn't flashy. He didn't have, he didn't, he was, he, he was just, it was a different time. Uh, St. Germain, the most evidence that we have of him was when he was hanging a lot with the aristocrats, the royalty, the kings, the queens, so forth and so on. So he, you know, he was, he had a lot more wealth pronouncing among him. His cufflinks were made of sapphires and, you know, emeralds and whatever. So he, he could, you know, this was his tool. And because of his precision as an alchemist and his beautiful diamonds and, and gemstones, and he could obviously produce them and, and had access to gaining access to them so he could give them away. You know, so the royal families, they were usually pretty happy to see him because he usually came bearing gifts. So, and so he was a very, um, there's so much mystery around St. Germain and there's so much mystery around all of this stuff. But um, a while back I, I had an experience where I was with some friends and the energies of, of the Lord, I call him, most people would associate him with the image of Jesus and Master Saint Germain, and they showed up, and it was funny because I was like, I was like, are you guys brothers? And I, I, I just, it was interesting to see them together, and then it was mind blowing to see that they would be the two main uh, attributes of of energy that would be the incoming into this new age that we're entering into Aquarius, and then we're learning about this new king, and this new king, they were talking about Sir Walter Raleigh coming from. Um, his, that's his grandfather, father, so uh, John, King John the Third, his his great 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 great, you know, a lot a lot of times removed, not removed, but times. I think it's 22 times was his grandfather, um, Walter Raleigh. So um, Walter Raleigh, it, it was very funny because I was going to read us the the esoterics of the United States, and you know, we've been taught about, uh, you know, so many people think all these things. Um, are evil like the the, the pyramid of the all-seeing eye and um, the the 13 and a lot of these symbols um, that we've now seen associated with government and stuff we've been taught all of the the inverted uh, symbology of what they actually truly stood for and one of those that was inverted was Freemasonry. Freemasonry actually started out to be a very positive thing. And it, it was converted over into some, some pretty rough stuff later on. But um, I think we should go into a little bit about the mystical origins of the United States and its esoteric foundations. So we can have a little bit more foundation of where this king is coming from. And um, this might be some of the energy that he's trying to re restore and reestablish would be the original energies that were of the founding fathers who were fighting for freedom, liberty, and to break away from the British crown. So this was the actual essence of, of what was happening at that time. So um, when we look at we look at this, we will begin. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than those of the United States. An invisible hand in the affairs of men in an age of power and politics, a scientific miracle and an ultimate threat. It may come as a surprise Sorry, Alice. that one of the most widely accepted and ancient of ideas was that a divine hand established and ruled the nations. Early Americans believed that an unseen intelligence detected and directed the course of the American Revolution and guided the destiny of it. This nation, John Adams wrote, America was designed by providence for the theater on which man was to make his true 
figure. And Patrick Henry said, There is a just God who presides over the destiny of nations. Evidence of the invisible hand of God is nowhere more apparent than in the affairs of our nation. For the swift ascent of the American Re Republic was nothing less than miraculous. From a loose coalition of seaboard states united as much by their dislike of the British king as by brotherly affection, the United States grew from a tiny pre-industrial community to the world's preeminent economic technological and military power in less than two centuries. America became a land of political and religious freedom and a beacon of hope to the nations and a stage for playing out the great historical epic. Hmm. By the 20th century, America had become a proud land. The American with history as his witness self-assured. So it was doubt it was doubtly surprising after World War II when the Republic was at the apparent zenith of her power that the Americans found themselves reeling under the hammer blows of events. Emerging out of the 1950s, the Republic plowed into heavy seas. Campuses, college, towns, and inner cities erupted into flames and violence. A gulf opened up between the youth and the aged, hip and square, black and white, conservative, liberal, and radical. Various and sundry revolutions tore through the nation. Like a series of earthquakes, drugs, rock and rebellion against the establishment among them, shaking the Republic to its foundation. With the suddenness of lightning, President John F. Kennedy, the image of our youth was struck down. The nation mourned like and the nation mourned and it was never the same. Sorry, I got a little hair on my nose. The darkness then covered the land. Oh, no, the nation mourned and it was never the same. And then Martin Luther King and other Kennedy assassination followed and darkness covered the land. Or was it a brooding spirit? We could see the outworkings of an inner design, a gleam of hope or the turning of the tide. By the mid seventies, the storm had largely subsided, but the nation was rudder, rudderless and in doldrums. Vietnam and Watergate troubled the national psyche and left most Americans unsure of their purpose. The Ford years were aimless and lackluster. During the Carter term, the U.S. prestige so declined that our allies no longer considered us, considered us the leader of the free world. But let us know that we were now an equal partner Soviet imperialism was unchallenged because it was presumed to be unimportant or not to exist. America, it seemed, had become a helpless, hapless giant. The capture of the 66 Americans in Iran was the height of ignominity, or was it ignominy? Ignominy. Hmm. It turned out, in fact, to be the turning point. First, there were tremors of shock and indignation. Then the seizure, galvanized by a growing but largely unnoticed wave of patriotism. Yankee ingen ingenuin ingenuin ooh, these are tough words. ingenuity, humor, and determinism, determinism then returned. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan mobilized. Americans resolved to resist the communism and suddenly the apparent dormant American spirit awakened 
to the dawn of a resurrection. President Carter was out of step with the new mood. The, elector the electorate swept him from office and installed a man who promised to lead America to restoration, Ronald Reagan. The 40th American president rode the resurgent American spirit to a resounding victory. Although one of Ronald Reagan's campaign themes was the return to America greatness. His election was more of an effort than a cause. He was riding the wave, not causing the tide. Something subtle, yet more powerful than any man, is and always has been propelling the nation forward towards some unnamed goal. Even though the pomp and circumstance of American heritage is back in style, the new patriotism is still more of a feeling than a consciousness or an articulation of values. There is still confusion about what course of action we the people should take. The problem is not one of indecision, but one of identity. When you know who you are, you know what to do. America, who are we? Most of our founding fathers they knew. Many early Americans also knew. They were the Israelites. Since only a few were Jews and none were citizens of a then non-existent Israel state, in what way did they deem themselves Israelites? They were Israelites because of their mystical identification with that the ancient people and their God. So they had a mystical identification with a higher power in essence. And they knew they, they had trust and faith in divine intervention and the power of prayer and God. These were truly faith driven, driven people. The majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them. Historians have recognized that the early Americans saw a striking similarity between their own hardships, history, and condition, and those of the children of Israel under Moses and Joshua. Joshua. Mm -hmm. It was as if they were reliving history. They baptized their children with the names of the Hebrew prophets and patriarchs and likened their present condition to Egyptian bondage, King James to Pharaoh, the ocean whose dangers their ancestors had encountered to the Red Sea and their new home in the America wilds. To the wilderness, Washington and Adams were often referred to as Moses and Joshua. All that was missing was the desert sands of Sinai. The Bible was no more than a religious guide to the early New England settlers. It was their political textbook as well. The early criminal codes came out of the Bible and they came from Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies. They were molded from the very things found in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. By 1776, it was widely accepted that God had established a new American Israel. The idea was preaching to approving congregations in sermons with titles such as the Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states, and the traits of resemblance in the people of the United States to the American, to, of America to ancient Israel. So this idea was so deeply rooted that the first design proposed for the seal of the United States depicted a pharaoh sitting in an open chariot passing through the divided waters of the Red Sea in hot pursuit of the children of Israel. Rays from pillars of fire shone on Moses as he raised his hands over the sea, causing it to overwhelm Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Yet, America was nearly four millennia removed and 6,000 miles away from the ancient lands where the Israelites had appeared. The story of the Israelites 
is a historic ep epic in which the God of Israel re revealed himself, established his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, renamed Jacob Israel, and promised a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. God's plan to liberate his people spiritually and temporally required a great foresight and a planning. Talk about invisible hands. God revealed the Egyptian captivity to Abraham before there were any Israelites to speak up. Jacob's son, Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers, was now risen to governship under Pharaoh, told them that God had brought him to Egypt. Jacob and his other sons followed suit, surviving in Egypt during the seven-year famine. But after Joseph and his generation had passed, the children of Israel multiplied greatly. And what Abraham had once seen in a dream came to pass, 400 years of bondage. See, so the, the Israel, the children of Israel, this is what the Lord showed me. Because I asked him this many times, what is this whole chosen people of God? Because that was not resonating with me. I'm like, we are all, we are all the same. Doesn't matter what color, what none of it matters to me. For for whatever reason, I have always felt that way. I mean, since I was a little kid, I was fascinated by an African American person. The first time I saw a black person, I walked up and grabbed her by the hand and I started stroking her hand. I was like, "Are you Chinese?" I thought she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I, you know, I wish we still had that awe that we did when we were children. When you see something that doesn't look exactly like you, instead of being defenses of it. You get curious and you want to know the mystery of it because you know it's part of, it has stuff that you don't. That's, that's awesome. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So I've always had this. And when I was asking the Lord about it, I was like, how could God choose one person over another? He says he doesn't. He says it's not about the color of your skin. It's about your heart. What do you believe? Do you believe in the creator? Do you believe in a higher power? Or do you believe in money and the religions of what you see? And do you believe in the power of man in this world? Or do you believe in the spirit? He says, those are my children of Israel. They are the children that hold Isis, Ra, and El. They hold the trinity of all three godly beings within them because they've ignited the triple flame fire within their own hearts. And that's what Jesus would always point to, the triple flame fire in your heart. And that is based from faith and belief in a higher power so that was what was explained to me was the children of Israel that we are the children of Israel the ones who do believe in a higher power or a God so that would be most of the people on this planet because this he wasn't saying that you know this excluded the people who believe in Allah or this excluded the people who never knew of Jesus he was like this is all my children who love and have faith in a higher power and a creator and know that they are part of that he was like, it's that simple. If you believe, he was like, then you're 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 a child you're a child of Israel. I was like, wow, that's okay. I was like, I can I can roll with that. That they would be God's favorites because they believe in God. And he goes, exactly. I was like, oh, all right, well, okay, I I can work with that, I guess. So, um, like I said, just a little bit of my own because I like have problems with some of these scriptures and stuff. And I would literally ask. I'd be like, what is this? I don't get this. This doesn't make sense. And that's how I found out I was a bond servant too, and that was a pretty rough day for me. So, and it says to pass 400 years of bondage <laughs> throughout their historical trek, even to the present, it has been axiomatic that when the Israelites were obedient to God, all goes well. When they failed to keep the commandments, God often uses neighboring peoples to illustrate to them the in exorable nature of the law of karmic karmic recompense so karmic karmic action coming straight back at you the purpose of the egyptian captivity was to allow the people to experience firsthand their own re calcitrance -si -si hmm. heaped upon them through their Egyptian taskmasters. Taskmasters. Wow. Let me read that one more time. Egyptian captivity was to allow the people to experience firsthand their own karma reaped upon them 
through their own Egyptian taskmaster. So the karma that they created through their Egyptian times and Egyptian pharaohs. And this also goes into the Atlantean times too, because part of the Atlantis experience was merged with the Egyptian experiences. Um, when it came time for their liberation, God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt to the edge of the promised land in Joshua to push them over the hill of their remaining waywardness. Under the brilliant leadership of Joshua, which Joshua Hallard, that's his name. The new king, is his name is Joshua. Interesting. So the Israelites took the land of promise in a lightning military campaign. One striking feature of the Israelite was their organization into tribal federation that gave each tribe considerable autonomy. This was the venerated republic that the early Americans admired and sought to recreate. The fortune of the Israelite was anything but constant. Again, the people became rebellious and were carried off into captivity by neighboring nations and later entirely disappeared. But all was not lost. Around 732 BC, Isaiah prophesied that one day the Lord would assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the, diver the di dispersed tribes of Judah from the four corners of the earth. There is considerable difference of opinions among the scholars and the theo theo theologians about the meaning of this prophecy. Some believe it refers to the Israelites' return to the 6th century BC, Bab Babylon captivity. Some believe the return from As Assyria, some to the formation of the modern state of Israel. And some believe it refers to the regathering of the 12 tribes of Israel on American soil. It seems that in the great odyssey of the Israelites, nearly 22 centuries passed before there were any visible signs of how this prophecy would be fulfilled. The stage was being set for a regathering of the Israelites, but the land to which they were destined to return had to be prepared. In fact, it had to be discovered. An assignment was given by the invisible hand to Christopher Columbus, who discovered America by prophecy. In carrying out his mission, he wrote, neither reason nor mathematics nor maps were of any use to me. Fully accomplished were the words of, I of, I of Isaiah. Columbus, life is clothed in mystery. The exact date or place of his birth is not known. Some claim he was Greek, others Genoese. Still others say a Spanish Jew. He was steeped in astrology, the writings of Marco Polo, the Old and New Testaments, and the Apocrypha. In the two words of his name, Cristobal Colon, Col -on, means Christ bearer or colonizer. So Cristobal Colon means Christ bearer or colonizer. So man of destiny, Christopher Columbus discovered the new world by, pro by prophecy. Neither by reason nor mathematics or maps were of any use to him. So he was guided to do this by a, an unseen hand. And he, they later, they talk about this too. He was not the first person to discover Amer America. And they were aware of this. The, this mysterious figure was an adept in, the po in poetical language of the secret societies of the 15th century and quite possibly a member of the great guild of weavers, secret societies, such as the Guilds, the Knights Templars, the Rosicrucians, and the Masons, were the repositories for these ancient sacred mystery teachings that were handed down to initiates throughout the history. 
The idea that there is a mystery teaching may seem to some to have a ring of exclusivity out of it. It steps with their enlightened notions of freedom of choice. Yet, behind the world of effects is an inner world of cause, whose light has illuminated men and women throughout the ages, shining in virtually all beneficial societal, scientific, and spiritual movements. Indeed, most religions have an inner teaching that is so similar and so ancient that the Aldea, that Adelis, Aldeus Huxley called it the perennial philosophy. Hmm. Secret societies were sponsored by a brotherhood of highly evolved spiritual beings known as the Great White Brotherhood, who magnetized the sacred fire to their heart's altar. The white light emanating from their auras gives them the appearance of being white robed, and they are referred to by John the Revelator as the saints robed in white. The Brotherhood of Adepts has always sought to elevate and enlighten the children of God, working from behind the veil, or beyond the veil, or secretly right in the very midst of the people. They have sponsored the great movements for religion, liberty, scientific advancement, and political freedom. The tradition of the secret societies is ancient. They existed at various times in, Ch in Chaldea, in Egypt, Greece, Italy, among the Hebrews, the Christians, the Muhammadans, and the others, virtually all the great teachers of all mankind. Homer, Moses, Pythagoras, Gudamada, Jesus, Paul, and others of like statue were initiates of the sacred mysteries. It was Columbus' sponsorship by this mystical brotherhood that made his voyage to the New World something quite out of the ordinary. America had been discovered again and again by Basquez, the Phoenicians, the Druids, the Libyans, the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Arabians, the Norsemen, the Danes, for nearly 2,500 years before Columbus. But Columbus bore in his heart an idea, even the archetypal image of a new race destined to be born out of an old. It was an idea whose time had come. The mantle of destiny descended on Columbus. And the next scene in the great epic of the Israelites was about to begin. As a result of the brotherhood, the sponsorship, the Christ bearer colonizer captured the old world's imagination and began the enormous colonization movement. The new nation was thus conceived and dedicated to what Roger Williams, the founder of the Rhode Island called soul liberty. But there was much to be done, for there was no declaration of independence, no constitution, and a few understood the karma of an ancient people who had lived before the great flood on the lost continent called Atlantis. Much less, why are, much less, why or how that past civilization would affect the new world. According to Plato, Atlantis was a land of gleaming white cities and golden temples that sank beneath the sea as a result of violent earthquakes and plasma events. 60 million were reported to have perished in a single night. Plato received his knowledge of Atlantis from reports brought back from the mystery schools of Egypt by one Solon, an Athenian lawgiver, lawgiver. Early Atlantis was the scene of a golden age civilization whose inhabitants lived together in great spiritual harmony. This is true. Later, discord, warfare, 
and the misuse of advanced technologies created the current conditions which caused the continent to sink. Although Atlantis is a legend to many, the legends have a way of moving from the realm of myth into reality. With a firm, with a few timely discoveries, in 1933, Edgar Cayce predicted that a portion of the Temple of Atlantis may soon be discovered off the Florida coast. Two pilots intrigued by this prediction kept watch as they flew over the area and in 1968, they discovered submerged ruins off Andros Island near Pine Key. The timing of their discovery is linked to at least, is linked at least by coincidence to another Casey prediction. In 1940, he said that the western part of Atlantis will be among the first portions of Atlantis to rise again. Expect it in 68 or 69. Since then, the submerged ruins of the steppe pyramids raised. Stone platforms and great construction projects have been discovered on the ocean floor throughout the Caribbean and the Western Atlantic. Although Atlantis may rise again physically in one respect, it had already returned through the reincarnation of its people. It's us. Reincarnation is widely accepted as a fact of life in the East, while still not universally embraced in the West. It is gaining a wider acceptance even in the scientific community, more often through individual experience and recall of former lives. General George Patton, the spectacularly successful World War II strategist, believed in reincarnation. Benjamin Franklin predicted his return in a new and more elegant edition revised and corrected by the author. An individual may reincarnate many, many times, seeking to perfect the soul and balance the karma. Likewise, entire civilizations reincarnate together to balance the karma and to work out their group destiny. Among those who had kept the standard integrity on Atlantis during its period of inequity were children of God who reincarnated as the early Israelites. Since then, the seed of Abraham has reincarnated again and again in all nationalities, all races, and all religions. Thus, wow. Eight, the infinity symbol, the symbol of reincarnation. I can't make this stuff up, man. Thus, the Israelites are distinguished solely by their devotion to the person and the principle of the one God. Indeed, they are the issue of the Christic seed imparted into, the, at the, into Abra, to Abraham. Yet, through reincarnation, they have been scattered across all boundaries of race and religion. The eastern seaboard of North America, a portion of the New World where the Israelites were, de were destined to reincarnate, was a part of Atlantis that did not sink. But even years after Columbus' voyage, the New World was far from habitable. One initiate of the Brotherhood worked tirelessly to reestablish the golden age, the civilization of Atlantis, and to provide the proper environment for the Israelites to fulfill their fiery destiny. <gasps> the incomprehensible Francis Bacon, and I must agree, this guy is a trip. Where has there arisen a genius of equal? Stature, hmm, Lord, Chancellor of England, philosopher, author, statesman, scientist, orator, and humorist. 
Bacon was one of the prophets and one of the scientific revolutionists. He instigated the formation and the influence of the course of the Royal Society and was a driving force in the, Elizabeth, in the Elizabethan Renaissance. Editor of the King James Bible and the first English essayist. Bacon is thought by many to be the true concealed author of the works of Shakespeare and other Eliz Elizabethan literature. In his most, most celebrated work, Novum Organum, Bacon presented a method of inductive logic, an insaratito magna. Bacon offered a plan for the total reconstruction of sciences, arts, and all human knowledge to restore man to mastery over nature. According to Alfred Dodd and other authorities, in 1580, the age of, at the age of 20, Bacon secretly founded the first Rostocrucian Brotherhood. And I think that we will pick up there when we start next time because this is getting pretty long. This is um, Francis Bacon. Wow, this guy, a lot of history to this guy. And he, and he did write some amazing things. And he, yes, he did uh, initiate the changes in the transcription of, of the King James Bible. And it's funny, too, because as he did that work, he did many other works. And some of those other works were profoundly... Uh, set to liber liberate and free humanity of its own, um, you know, by its own will. So, like I said, there is a dark part of this stuff and there's a light part of this stuff. So you need to be able to see both parts and you need to understand that both parts were always existing and they were always teetering back and forth where the dark would be in power, then the light would be in power. And this was going on. But the Atlantis situation... Um, we are holding some serious karma with that because of the misuse of technology. And just like Bacon stated, to bring man into perfection, to conquer nature, that's where we screwed up. We don't conquer nature. We integrate with nature. And we turn our nature primal instincts into fine-tuned alchemy. And when you go through the alchemy and you become the Christ, the instinct turns into intuition. And through that intuition, you become more like Christ and more like, more like the gods, because you 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 have an internal knowing, you have a, a consistent, um, you have an awareness of your spirit, and you're not just so consumed by the fleshly body and, and the world. You're aware of the spiritual consequences, karma, laws, and energy that's happening around you all the time. This is being. A, an awakened child and you know the one God principle because we understand that all is creation and creation is one energy and that energy is the energy of God and that God energy is the 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 awareness within, within you that you are the I am of, of that I am so it's like we are part of this and it's like everything's been twisted around and all these things have been made evil the the all-seeing eye of the pyramid that's the original symbol of the pineal gland awakening through becoming the Christ. This was the original symbol of Christ. So I mean, these things have been completely twisted around and turned backwards and they're being used in the inverted. So a lot of these symbols are being used for very dark practices and dark magic. And then on the other hand, you have people who have been using them for ancient eons of time in the upright, positive um, interpretation of those symbols. And like I said, symbols are vast in their power because they're so um they're they're big and they do contain both polarities within them so um it's it's kind of amazing but these people have been working on this new atlantis for thousands of years thousands of years since the fall of atlantis we have been working on this new atlantis and like i said there's a dark New Atlantis connotation, and then there's the connotation of the New Atlantis in light. And that would be the correction and the healing and the the coming into balance with nature and technology as integrating them into a balanced system where it, it is 
guys, if we can do this, we'll see heaven on earth because the technology will be off the hook, but it will be supporting nature and working with nature. And in, in that, it actually extends our life. And this is the natural effect of what this would, would do. And in the Atlantean times, when we were still in balance with nature and technology, we lived a lot longer. So this is why we're not living so long, is because we, we're, our lifespans right now are shortening again. They were longer uh, 15 to 20 years ago than they are right now, and that's because we're getting toxic again. The technology is out of balance, so we've got to find a way to bring this stuff into balance and bring it into soul liberation and soul unity and soul harmony we have got to bring things into balance um, because if we don't we're going to be destroyed again and this is what i've seen it's like either you learn or you don't but we we were supposed to win this time and we win because of this awakening that we have within the christ within us that's what i was shown a thousand times you came here to be like jesus meaning a mass amount of you would waken to your power and what we really are and what we came here to do, and what we came here to correct. So um, this is all just coming into alignment. And, and with um, the, the, the powers that be might be potentially moving out of their power, and we're coming into a new king who's claiming to be the, the Christ, and then he writes this beautiful power poem about the integration of all belief systems being you know subordinate to the one only cosmic fire, which is the creator. And I've seen that. That's why the spark, we come from the spark. That spark came out of that fire. So it's like, this is profound. There's profound things happening right now. And in this information, we're going to get into Sir Walter Raleigh and how he's connected to this and how he's connected to all of this through um, the, the Masons. And we're going to learn more about the Masons and the true origins of Masons. And, I mean, of course, yes, 